Homir Mun arranged to have his little cruiser, the Unimara, taken out of its winter cobwebbery. A few days later he left Terminus in a sullen distemper. No one was at the port to see him off. That was natural, since no one ever had in the past. He knew very well that it was important to have this trip in no way different from any he had made in the past. Yet he felt drenched in a vague resentment. He, Homir Mun, was risking his neck in daring do of the most outrageous sort, and yet he left alone. At least, so he thought. And it was because he thought wrongly that the following day was one of confusion, both on the Unimara and in Dr. Darrell's suburban home. It hit Dr. Darrell's home first, in the form of a letter addressed to him in the ornate and flowing handwriting of Arcadia's transcriber. Dear Father, it would have been simply too heartbreaking to say goodbye to you in person. I might have cried like a little girl, and you would have been ashamed of me. So I'm writing a letter instead to tell you how much I'll miss you, even while I'm having this perfectly wonderful summer vacation with Uncle Homer. I'll take good care of myself, and it won't be long before I'm home again. Meanwhile, I'm leaving you something that's all my own. You can have it now. Your loving daughter, Arkady. Dr. Darrell read the letter through several times with an expression that grew blanker each time. Anthor's reaction later was somewhat hotter. He punctuated his initial remarks with clenched fists and torn hair. Great space, what are you waiting for? What are we both waiting for? Get the transport on the viewer and have them contact the Unimara. Softly, Pelias. She's my daughter. But it's not your galaxy. Now wait. She's an intelligent girl, and we had better try to follow her thoughts before we act. Do you know what this thing is? No. Why should it matter what it is? Because it's a sound receiver. It's homemade, but it will work. I've tested it. Don't you see? It's her way of telling us that she's been party to our conversations of policy. She knows where Homer Munn is going and why. She's decided it would be exciting to go along. Oh, great space, groaned Anthor. Another mind for the second foundation to pick. Except that there's no reason why the second foundation should a priori suspect a fourteen-year-old girl of being a danger unless we do anything to attract attention to her, such as calling back a ship out of space for no reason other than to take her off it. Do you forget with whom we're dealing? But we can't have everything depend on an insane child. She's not insane, and we have no choice. Her letter suggests that we convert the entire matter into a friendly offer on the part of Mun to take an old friend's daughter off for a short vacation. It's a perfectly natural thing. A spy does not carry a fourteen-year-old niece about with him. So, what will Mun do when he finds her? Dr. Darrell heaved his eyebrows once. I can't say, but I presume she'll handle him. The excitement on the Unimara was considerably more intense. In the luggage compartment, Arcadia waited frantically for the sounds of sleep to arise, then poked her head out the door into the single room of the spacecraft. Unfortunately, Homer Munn was awake. He had been reading in bed, bathed in the soft bedlight, and now he was staring into the darkness with wide eyes and groping stealthily under the pillow. I've got a blaster and I'm shooting. Well, don't shoot, Arcadia wailed. It's only me. She stepped out. Would you excuse me for a minute? I've got to wash my hands. She knew the geography of the vessel and crossed quickly to the sink. When she turned around, Homer Munn was standing before her with a faded bathrobe on the outside and a brilliant fury on the inside. What the black hole, of space, are you d d doing aboard this ship? I just wanted to come along, Uncle Homer. Well, why? I'm not going anywhere. You're going to Calgan for information about the Second Foundation. For one horrifying moment, Arcadia thought he was going to have hysterics, but he struggled back to relative normalcy and managed to listen to her explanations of why she shouldn't be taken back, why her father wouldn't worry, how she knew about Calgan, etc. She was just finishing this recital. He scram. She said, That's my father, I bet. And it was. The message wasn't long, and it was addressed to Arcadia. It said, Thank you for your lovely present, which I'm sure you put to good use. Have a good time. You see, she said to Homer, that's instructions. 
He grew used to her. After a while, he was glad she was there. Eventually, he wondered how he would have made it without her. She prattled. She was excited. She knew the second foundation was the enemy, yet it didn't bother her. Maybe it came of being fourteen. On the evening before the last hyperspace jump, Arcadia sat dreaming of Trontor, of all places. For some reason, although they would soon be on Calgon, she found herself more and more obsessed with Trontor, her birthplace. Were you ever on Trontor, Uncle Homer? No, can't say I was, Arcady. She found Uncle Homer delightful. He hadn't missed calling her Arcady for days. There might be incredible amounts of information on Trontor. Why don't we go there when we're finished with Calgon? But Homer Munn was busy with the ship's computer and hadn't really heard her. The sun of Calgon no longer appeared as a star in space, but as a sun, large, bright, and yellow-white. Their destination was only a night's sleep away. Under the mule, Calgon had been mistress of the greatest empire since the end of the Galactic Empire itself. But now the planet was left with only the bewildering memory of that short space of power, like an opium dream. The current first citizen, Lord Stetton, had held the position for five months. Though not exactly legitimate, he was the former head of the Calganian Navy, he was extremely capable and nobody's fool. Tonight, in his private apartments, he was dining with the Lady Callia, his more than friend yet less than wife, and his first minister, Lev Myrus. Myrus, he was saying, I'm tired of inaction. All Calgan desires the return of empire and glory. In all history, the First Minister said, it has never been wise to attack the Foundation. Even the mule would have been wiser to refrain. Suddenly there were tears in the Lady Callia's blue, empty eyes. Of late her poochie, for this is what she called Lord Stetton, scarcely saw her. And now, when he had promised her the whole evening, this horrible, thin, grey man, who always looked through her rather than at her, had forced his way in, and Poochie had led him. Stetton was speaking now, in the voice she hated hard and impatient. He was saying, You're a slave to the far past, Myrus. The foundation is loosely knit and will fall apart at a blow. And the second foundation? Myrus asked coldly. And the second foundation, repeated Stetton as coolly, aren't you aware that a good many of the foundation psychologists and sociologists are of the opinion that the Selden plan has been completely disrupted since the days of the mule? If the plan has gone, then a vacuum exists, which I may fill as well as the next man. Our knowledge of these matters is not great enough to warrant the gamble, Myrus insisted. Our knowledge, perhaps, replied Stetton, but we have a foundation visitor on the planet, a Homer Mun, who has written articles on the mule, and is of the opinion that the Selden plan no longer exists. The first minister nodded. I have heard of him, or at least of his writings. What does he want? He asks permission to enter the mule's palace. Indeed, it would be wiser to refuse— I will consider that, and we will speak again. Myrus bowed himself out. There was a silence into which the Lady Callia said tearfully, Are you angry with me, Poochie? Stetton turned on her. Haven't I asked you never to call me that ridiculous name? He stared at her darkly. It was a mystery to him why he tolerated her these days. She had been all very well when he had been an admiral only, but now, as first citizen and future conqueror, he needed more. He needed heirs who would unite his future dominions, something the mule had never had. Calia as first lady, ridiculous. He needed to fuse himself with one of the great historic families of the Foundation. As Poochie's granite face softened somewhat, Calia cheered up a little. She lifted herself from her chair in a single fluid motion and melted toward him. You're not going to scold me, are you? No, he patted her absently. Now just sit quietly for a while, will you? I want to think. About the man from the foundation? Yes. Poochie, I've heard the man has a little girl with him. Could I see her when she comes? I hardly ever see children, and you know how I love them. He looked at her sardonically. She never tired of this approach. She loved children, i.e., his children. But actually it wasn't a bad idea, 
and it would take the child off his hands. You can see the girl and talk to her all you want, but not near me, understand? We won't bother you, honestly. I'll have her in my rooms. Callia was happy again. It wasn't very often these days that she was allowed to have her way. She put her arms around Stetton's neck, and after the slightest hesitation, she felt his large head come softly down upon her shoulder. Arcadia felt triumphant. How life had changed since Peleus Anthor had stuck his distinguished face up against her window, and all because she had had the vision and courage to do what needed to be done. Here she was on Calgan. Yesterday she had bought some long, shiny dresses that made her look taller. Homer had given her a ten-credit bill, and foundation money went a long way on Calgan. And she had had her hair done. But best of all was right now. She was face to face with the actual mistress of the ruler of Calgan. Of course, the Lady Calia didn't quite come up to Arcadia's notion of the part. She was rather plump, and her voice wasn't thrillingly throaty, but rather high. Would you like some more tea, child? I'll have another cup, thank you, my lady. You know, I think Mr. Munn must be very brave to wish to see the mule's palace. Arcadia's internal awareness twitched. This was what she was waiting for. Intrigue, intrigue. With great indifference, she asked, Why must one be brave to see the mule's palace? Didn't you know? There's a curse on it. Nobody on Calgon would dare even enter the grounds. A thought struck Lady Calia, and she was suddenly all curiosity. But why does Mr. Munn want to see the palace? It was here that Arcadia's careful plan could be put into action. Her thoughts kept a sentence ahead of her words as she said, Uncle Homer's a great authority on the mule, you know. He thinks that all of galactic history has been changed since the mule conquered the foundation. Fascinating. Yes, the second foundation, I'm sure you've heard of it, stopped the mule because he was premature. But now they may be supporting Calgan. Calgan? Lady Calia was incredulous. But why? Because Calgan may now offer the best chance of being the nucleus for a new empire. Dimly, Lady Calia seemed to grasp something. You mean Poochie, Lord Stetton, is going to make a new empire? Well, Uncle Homer thinks so, but he'll have to see the mule's records to find out for sure. It's all very complicated, said Lady Calia doubtfully. Yes, said Arcadia. She had done her best. Lord Stetton was in a savage humor. The session with the milksop from the Foundation had been quite unrewarding. Great galaxy! Why should Munn or anyone else be allowed to violate the customs of Calgan? No one wanted to read another book on the mule anyway. What do you want? he asked as Calia entered and cringed in the doorway. Don't be angry, Poochie. It's just that the little girl told me they were going into the mule's palace, and I thought I could go with them. It must be gorgeous inside. She told you that, did she? Well, they aren't, and you aren't. Now go and tend to your own business. I've had about enough of you. But, Poochie, why aren't you going to let them? The little girl said that you were going to make an empire. I don't care what she said. What was that? He strode to Callie and caught her firmly above the elbow so that his fingers sank deeply into the soft flesh. What did she tell you? You're hurting me. Besides, she made me promise not to tell. That's too bad. Tell me. Now. Well, Arcadia said the Selden plan was changed, and there was another foundation somewhere that was arranging to have you make an empire. That's all. Are you angry? Stetton left the room hurriedly, with Calia staring mournfully after him. Two orders were sent out over the official seal of the first citizen before the hour was up. One had the effect of sending five hundred ships into space on what were officially termed war games. The other had the effect of throwing a single man into confusion. Homer Munn ceased all preparations to leave when that second order reached him. It was, of course... Official permission to enter the palace of the mule. Arcadia was delighted. She knew what had happened. Or at any rate, she thought she did. 
For two weeks, Homir Mun practically lived inside the mule's palace. One evening after dinner, he was summoned to a meeting with Lord Stetton. Well, Mun, have you found anything? I know you're not here merely to rake through the mule's dead ashes. You came here for more than you have admitted. Is that not true? I do, don't understand, my lord. Let us be frank, Mun. You are investigating the Selwyn plan. You know that it no longer holds. You know, perhaps, that I am the inevitable winner now, I and my heirs. So why not throw in your lot with mine? You will be rewarded in the end with your fair share of the loot. And what can you expect at the Foundation? Their defeat is inevitable. Do you have a patriotic desire to die for your country? Ah, ah, ah. Not a word would come, so Homer sputtered into silence. You will stay, said Stetton confidently. Now there's one more thing I wish to discuss with you. I have information to the effect that your niece is of the family of Beta Daryl. It is a family of note on the foundation, I take it. Homer uttered a startled, Yes. He could not trust himself at this point to be capable of weaving anything but cold truth. How old is she? Fourteen. So... Well, not even the second foundation or Harry Selden himself could stop time passing or girls from becoming women. Lady Callia is a remnant of an interlude that has lasted too long. It will end soon. Fourteen, you say? Homer could only stare at him in horror. Arcadia was in the Lady Callia's pink fluff boudoir. The mistress of Calgon seemed unusually anxious, almost frantic. Take off your clothes, child, she suddenly said to Arcadia. Please, please, this way they won't recognize you. Calia started throwing useless bits of flummery and reckless heaps upon the ground, looking madly for something a girl could wear without becoming a living invitation to dalliance. Here, this will do. Put it on. Do you have money? Here, take this and this. Calia stripped her ears and fingers of jewelry. Just go home. Go home to your foundation. But what about Uncle Homer? Arcadia was becoming thoroughly confused and somewhat frightened. He won't leave. Poochie will hold him forever. But you mustn't stay. You must go back to warn your people there will be war. Absolute terror seemed, paradoxically, to have lent a lucidity to Calia's thoughts and words that was entirely out of character. She led Arcadia down corridors and past various officials. Guards clicked heels and presented arms when they went through doors. Outside Lord Stetton's residence, Calia gave Arcadia a last piece of advice. Go straight to the spaceport. Don't wait. He may be looking for you this very minute. Belatedly, now that she felt the free air about her, Arcadia was suspicious. Why are you doing this, Lady Calia? Calia bit her lower lip. I can't explain it to a little girl like you. You'll be growing up, and I... I met... Poochie, when I was sixteen, I can't have you about, you know. There was a half-ashamed hostility in her eyes. The implications of what she heard froze Arcadia's blood. She whispered, What will he do to you when he finds out? Calia whimpered back, I don't know, and left at a half-run back along the wide way to the mansion of the Lord of Calgan. And for one eternal second, Arcadia still did not move. For in that last moment, before the Lady Calia left, the girl had seen something. Calia's frightened, frantic eyes had momentarily lit up with a cold amusement, a vast, inhuman amusement. It was much to see in a flicker of time, but Arcadia had no doubt of what she saw. She was running now, running wildly, searching madly for an unoccupied public booth at which one could press a button for a public conveyance. She was not running from Lord Stetton, not from him, nor from all the human hounds he could place at her heels. She was running from a single, frail woman who had helped her escape, from a creature who had loaded her with money and jewels, who had risked her own life to save her, from an entity she knew, certainly and finally, to be a woman of the Second Foundation.
An air taxi came to a soft, clicking halt in the cradle. The wind of its coming brushed against Arcadia's face. Where to, lady? She pitched her voice as low as possible in order to sound adult. The spaceport, please. The lights of the city moved leisurely below her as she cooled her cheek against the slightly musty upholstery. What should she do? What should she do? In that moment she knew she was a stupid, stupid little girl away from her father and frightened. Her eyes were full of tears. She wasn't afraid that Lord Stetton would catch her. Lady Callia would see to that Callia. She had stupidly played right into Callia's hands. But why was she free while Homer was a prisoner? Unless, unless they wanted her to go back to the Foundation as a decoy, a decoy to lead others into the hands of, of them. Spaceport lady. She pushed a bill at him and stumbled out the door. She saw lights, unconcerned men and women, large, gleaming departure boards. Where was she going? She didn't care. She only knew that she wasn't going to the Foundation. Anywhere else would do. Oh, thanks, Selden. Thanks, Selden, for that forgetful moment, that last split second when Callia, tiring of her act because she had to deal with a child, had let her amusement spring through. And then something occurred to Arcadia, something that had been stirring and moving at the base of her brain since she had left the taxi. And she knew that she must escape. She could not risk her own life, not in the slightest, for any reason whatsoever. She was the most important person in the galaxy. She was the only person in the galaxy, because in all the galaxy she, and she alone, except for them, knew the location of the second foundation. There is nothing quite like a busy spaceport on the outskirts of the capital city of a populous planet. The floods of humanity milling about on their way to all the stars of the galaxy form a crowd with a purpose. Lines queue up, parents herd their children, everyone is going somewhere. Consider, then, the complete psychic isolation of a single unit of this terribly intent mob that does not know where to go, yet at the same time feels more intensely than any of the others the necessity of going somewhere, anywhere. Arcadia Darrow, dressed in borrowed clothes, standing on a borrowed planet in a borrowed situation of what seemed to be a borrowed life, wanted earnestly to go back to the womb. She wanted a closed spot somewhere far, far away. The voice that cut in on her was a thunderclap. Look, miss, it said irritably. Are you using the ticket machine? Are you just standing there? What happened next was slow and dreamlike, as she realized that she was standing in front of a ticket machine. Arcadia plunged a two hundred credit into the clipper and was suddenly aware of the button labeled Trontor. Trontor, dead capital of the dead empire, the planet on which she was born. She pressed the button, and the ticket was spit out toward her. She seized it and ran. And then, attempting to look both ways simultaneously, she ran head-on into a soft abdomen. She heard the startled exhalation and grunt, and felt a hand on her arm. She writhed desperately, but lacked breath to do more than mew a bit. She managed to look at her captor's face. He was plump-cheeked and rather short. His copious white hair was brushed back in a pompadour that looked incongruous above his round and ruddy peasant face. "'What's the matter?' he said with a frank and twinkling curiosity. "'You look scared.' "'Sorry, I've got to go now. Pardon me.' But he disregarded her and lifted her ticket from her unresistant white fingers and looked at it with every evidence of satisfaction. "'I thought so,' he said, and then he bawled out in bull-like tones, "'Mama!' A woman was instantly at his side. She was even more short even more round, even more ruddy than the man. "'She's going to Trantor,' the man said. "'You're from Trantor. Let go her arm, Papa.' Mama turned the overstuffed valise she was carrying onto its side, and with a gentle but unrelenting pressure forced Arcadia to sit down. "'There will be no ship yet for an hour. Why don't you rest your little feet?' Arcadia drew a deep breath and gave in. Huskily, she said, "'I was born there. Mama clapped her hands gleefully. 
One month we've been here, and till now we've met nobody from home. This is very nice. Mama, Papa plucked at the woman's sleeve. I think she's frightened. I think there's something wrong. Mama joined Arcadia on the valise, which creaked wearily under the added weight. Are you running away, sweetheart? Don't be afraid to tell us. We'll help you. Arcadia looked across at the kind, gray eyes of the woman, and suddenly she was crying, crying like a little baby and glad of it. She clutched tightly at Mama's old-fashioned dress and dampened the corner of it thoroughly. Papa stood helplessly looking at the pair, finally finding a handkerchief which, when produced, was snatched from his hand. Finally the weeping trickled to a halt, and Arcadia started groping in her purse, which she still possessed despite the rapid clothes changing forced upon her in Lady Callia's apartments. She found what she was looking for and handed it to Mama. These are my papers, she said diffidently. It was a shiny synthetic parchment which had been issued her by the Foundation's ambassador on the day of her arrival, and which had been countersigned by the appropriate Calganian official. Mama passed it to Papa, who absorbed its contents with an impressive pursing of the lips. Born on Trantor, all right, and you're named Arcadia. That's a good Trantorian name. Where's your uncle? Says here you came in the company of Homir Mun, uncle. He's been arrested, said Arcadia. Out poured the story of the duplicitous Lady Callia and the libidinous Lord Stetton, at the end of which Mama shook her head darkly and said, That such people should be let live. Suddenly, loud metallic words were booming overhead, and five thousand pairs of startled eyes looked upwards. Men and women, the spaceport is being searched for a dangerous fugitive. No one will enter and no one will leave. No one will miss his ship. I repeat, no one will miss his ship. The grid will descend. You will stay inside your square until the grid is removed, or we will be forced to use our neuronic whips. Arcadia knew they were looking for her, but why? Callia had engineered her escape. Had Callia failed? Could Callia fail? Or was this part of the plan, the intricacies of which escaped her? For a vertiginous moment she wanted to jump up and shout at the police that she gave up, that she would go with them. But Mama's hand was on her wrist. Quick, quick, we'll go to the ladies' room before they start. Arcadia followed blindly. The grid was descending now, a series of cross-hatched radiation beams that set the air aglow with light. In his own hundred square feet, Papa found himself alone and conspicuously isolated. All the adjoining squares were crowded, but there was nothing to be done about it. He waited. He could make out over the heads of the eerily quiet and waiting crowd the far-off stir that was the line of policemen covering the vast floor area, lighted square by lighted square. It was a long time before a uniformed policeman stepped into his square and carefully noted the coordinates into a notebook. Papers. Papa handed them over, and they were flipped through in expert fashion. Your Prem Palver, native of Trantor, returning to Trantor. Answer yes or no. Y yes, yes. What's your business on Calgan? I'm trading representative of our farm cooperative. I've been negotiating terms with the Department of Agriculture on Calgan. Hmm. Says here your wife is with you. Where is she? Well, please, my wife is in there. He pointed. Anto, roared the policeman, and another uniform joined him. Another dame in the can. Write down her name. He turned to Papa. Anyone else with you? My niece. She's not mentioned in the papers. She came separately. Where is she? Never mind, I know. Write down the niece's name, too, Anto. Just stay here, Palver. We'll take care of the women before we leave. Papa waited interminably. After what seemed like hours, he saw Mama marching towards him. Arcadia's hand firmly in hers, and two policemen trailing behind. "'Is this noisy old woman your wife?' asked the first policeman. Uh, "'Yes, sir,' said Papa placatingly. "'And you'd better tell her to talk to the first citizen's police with courtesy.' He straightened his shoulders angrily. "'Is this your niece?' Uh, "'Yes, sir. I want her papers.' Looking straight at her husband, Mama slightly but no less firmly shook her head. A short pause and Papa said with a weak smile, I don't think I can do that. I claim diplomatic immunity. I'm accredited to the Calganian government as an official foreign representative, and my papers prove it. There was a pause while the policeman's lips tightened. Keep your eye on them, Hanto. I'll get Lieutenant Dirige. 
Perhaps two minutes elapsed before the policeman returned with the lieutenant. Is this the girl? Lieutenant Dirige asked wearily. She obviously fitted the description. All this for a child. He said, Her papers, please. Papa began. I have already explained. I know what you have explained, and I'm sorry, said the lieutenant. But I have my orders, and I can't help them. If necessary, I must use force. There was a pause, and the lieutenant waited patiently. Then Papa said huskily, Give me your papers, Arcadia. Arcadia shook her head in panic, but Papa nodded his head. Don't be afraid. Give them to me. Helplessly, she handed him the documents. Papa fumbled them open and looked carefully through them, then handed them over. The lieutenant, in his turn, looked through them carefully. For a long moment, he raised his eyes to rest them on Arcadia. Then he closed the booklet with a sharp snap. All in order, he said. All right, men. All three policemen retreated, and in three minutes the grid was gone. The noise of the crowd suddenly released rose high. Arcadia said, How? How? Papa said, Shh, don't say a word. Let's go to the ship. It should be in the berth by now. They were on the ship. They had a private stateroom and a table to themselves in the dining room. Over coffee, Arcadia dared to broach the subject again. But they were after me, Mr. Palver, and they must have had my description and all the details. Why did that lieutenant let me go? Papa smiled broadly. When you've been dealing with agents and buyers for twenty years, you learn some of the tricks. When Lieutenant Dirige opened your papers, he found a five-hundred-credit bill inside, folded up small. Simple, no? I'll pay you back, Arcadia insisted. But what if he'd taken the money and turned me in anyway, and accused me of bribery? And give up five hundred credits? <laughs> I know these people better than you do, girl. But Arcadia knew that he did not know people better, not these people. She lay awake that night and knew that no bribe would have stopped the police lieutenant unless that had been planned. They didn't want to catch her, yet had made every motion of doing so nevertheless. Why? To make sure she left? And for Trontor? Were the obtuse and soft-hearted couple she was with now only a pair of tools in the hands of the Second Foundation, as helpless as she herself? It was all so useless. Whatever she did, it might be only what the terrible omnipotence wanted her to do. She had to outwit them. Had to. Had to. It was thirty-two days since Arcadia had left home. Dr. Darrell sat in his study with Elvit Semek, the physics professor, poring over a blueprint. The only thing that kept him going now was work. What we're doing now, he told Semek, could be more important to everyone in the galaxy than the question of whether Arcadia is safe, at least to everyone but Arcadia and myself, and I'm willing to go along with the majority. Semek looked doubtful. All right, then. Well, the symes molf resonator isn't a problem, but we're going to need hyper-relays, a thundering lot of them. They are the only things that could work fast enough. How small can you make the whole gadget? Well, hyper-relays can be had micro-size, wiring, chips. You've got a few hundred circuits there, you know. I know. How big? Semek indicated with his hands. Too big, said Darrell. I've got to swing it from my belt. There was a buzz. Darrell looked out the window. Ah, here is Anthor and someone with him. Nothing about our little gadget yet, Semek. It's deadly knowledge, and two lives are enough to risk. Anthor said, Dr. Darrell, Dr. Semek, this is Police Lieutenant Dirige. He was the last man on Calgon to see your daughter. Darrell went white with apprehension. Is my daughter dead? She was alive when she left Calgon, said the lieutenant. I have no knowledge past that. Let me fill you in, Anthor said to Darrell and Semek. Lieutenant Dirige is one of us. He was born on Calgon, but his father was a Foundation man brought to that planet in the service of the mule. I can answer for the lieutenant's loyalty to the Foundation. With Mun's disappearance, he has become our main source of information on Calgon. Dirige spoke calmly. As far as I know, Dr. Darrell, your daughter is on Trantor. She had a ticket to that planet and was with a trading representative of Trantor named Prem Palver, who claimed she was his niece. Your daughter seems to have a penchant for collecting uncles. The Trantorian even tried to bribe me, probably thinks that's why they got away. 
How was she? Darrell asked. Unharmed, as far as I could see. There was a pause. Do you know anything about Trantor, Doctor? I lived there once. Arcadia was born there. It's an agricultural world now, the lieutenant said. They export animal fodder and grains mostly and sell them all over the galaxy. There are one or two dozen farm cooperatives on the planet. Each has its representative. Shrewd sons of guns. I know this Trantorian's record. He's been on Calgon before. Perfectly honest. Perfectly harmless. Later, when Semek and Dirige had gone, Daryl and Anthor sat talking in Daryl's living room. Look, Doc, said Anthor, why don't you go to Trantor? You're not yourself lately, and you're not doing much of value here. If I were you, I'd go and get the girl. It's what I want to do, and that's why I won't do it. Look here, Anthor. We both know we're playing with something completely beyond our powers to fight. To us, all life is a series of accidents to be met with improvisations. To the second foundation, all life is purposive to be met with pre-calculation. But they have their weaknesses. Their work is statistical, and only the mass action of humanity is truly inevitable. The plan leaves individuals to indeterminacy and free will. Since the second foundation has calculated my probable reactions, I will distrust my own impulses and desires. I will stay here despite the fact that I yearn very desperately to leave. Don't you see? The intricate act of luring my daughter halfway across the galaxy cannot be meant to make me stay where I am, since I would most certainly have stayed if they had done nothing. It can only be to make me move. And so I will stay. I think you're missing something, Doc. Yes, Arcadia's escape was arranged, but Arcadia knew it was arranged. Arcadia, the bright little girl who saw cabals everywhere, must have seen this one and followed your own type of reasoning. Her decision to go to Trantor instead of returning here was a deliberate attempt to flummox the second foundation. And there's another thing. Dirige is controlled. I can show you his encephalograph. He allowed Arcadia to escape not because he was our man, but because he was the second foundation's. He paused. The little signal light on Daryl's video set was flashing, signifying the presence of emergency news. Daryl turned it on, and within a few seconds, both men learned that for the first time in nearly half a century, the Foundation was at war, this time with Calgon. Anthor's jaw was set in a hard line. All right, Doc, you heard that. Calgon has attacked a Foundation ship, and Calgon is probably under the control of the second Foundation. I ask you again... Will you follow your daughter's lead and go to Trantor? No. I will stay here. You are not as intelligent as your daughter, Dr. Darrell. I wonder how far you can be trusted. Without another word, Anthor turned on his heel and left. Stettin, the Lord of Calgon, stood before a model of the galaxy and smiled. Addressing the six men of his general staff, he said, I think the situation is clear. We can afford to wait. The men of the Foundation cannot prepare. They're ideologically incapable of it. It is in their very nature to believe that the Second Foundation will save them. But not this time, eh? Stetton made his way back to his private chambers with a fixed smile on his face. Everything was going well. But he still had to deal with Kalia and her stupid jealousy. Space, if only he had the Daryl girl. Why hadn't he ground Kalia's skull to powder for that? He couldn't quite put his finger on the reason. Maybe it was because Kalia got along so well with Mun, and he needed Mun. It was Mun, for instance, who had demonstrated that, at least in the belief of the mule, there was no second foundation. His admirals needed that assurance. Was it actually Kalia who had gotten Mun to say that? But she couldn't convince anyone of anything. He shook his head to clear his mind and kept walking. Trantor was a world in death and rebirth, set like a faded jewel in the midst of the bewildering crowd of suns at the center of the galaxy. It alternately dreamed of past and future. It had been a single city, housing 400 billion administrators, the mightiest capital that had ever been. But eventually the decay of the empire had reached it, and in the great sack, its drooping powers had been broken forever. In the blasting ruin of death, the metal shell that surrounded the planet 
crumpled into an aching mockery of its own grandeur. Slowly the soil was uncovered, and the planet returned to its beginnings. In the spreading acres of primitive agriculture, it forgot its intricate and colossal past, or would have but for the still mighty metal shards that heaped their massive ruins toward the sky in bitter and dignified silence. Arcadia watched the shards on the horizon with a stirring of the heart. The village in which the Palvers lived was but a huddle of houses to her, small and primitive. The fields that surrounded it were golden yellow wheat-clogged tracks. But there, on the horizon, was the memory of the past, still glowing in unrusted splendor, and burning with fire where the sun of Trantor caught it. She had been there once during the months since she had arrived on Trantor. She had ventured into the silent, dust-streaked structures where the light entered through broken walls and partitions. It had been solidified heartache. It had been blasphemy. She had left, running until her feet pounded on wheat fields once more. She knew she would not disturb that mighty brooding again. Somewhere on this world she knew she had been born, near the old imperial library, the most sacred site on Trantor. There Harry Selden and his group had woven their unimaginable web. There Ebling Miz had pierced the secret and sat numbed in his vast surprise until he was killed to prevent the secret from going further. There at the Imperial Library her grandparents had lived for ten years until the mule had died and they could return to the reborn foundation. There her own father had returned with his bride to find the second foundation but had failed. There she had been born, and there her mother had died. She would have liked to visit the library again, but Prem Palver shook his round head. Oh, it's thousands of miles, Arkady, and there's so much to do here. Besides, it's not good to bother the place. You know, it's a shrine. It was the mule's palace all over again, Arcadia thought, a superstitious fear on the part of the pygmies of the present for the relics of the giants of the past. Still, it would have been horrible to feel a grudge against the funny little man for that. She had been on Trantor for over three months, and in all that time, Papa and Mama had been wonderful to her. One morning at breakfast, after a side-long look at his wife, Papa casually mentioned that Calgan and the Foundation had been fighting each other for two months. What? said Arcadia. The Foundation is at war? A horrible thought struck her. Are the Calganians on Terminus? No, said Papa seriously. Terminus is still fighting. The foundation is back to the Four Kingdom Core, the original realm that was built up under Salvor Hardin, the first mayor. There was a pause while Arcadia thought furiously. Whatever happened, she must inform her father. Somehow, she must. You know, Papa, I'll bet the foundation would be willing to pay smugglers' prices for food now. If a cooperative, one right here on Tranter, for instance took over the job? They might lose some ships, but they'd be war millionaires before it was all over. Papa said, But the foundation is so far away. Oh, I know. I guess you couldn't do it from here. If you took a regular liner, you probably couldn't get closer than Messina or Schmushik, and after that you'd have to hire a small scout ship or something to slip in through the lines. Papa's hand brushed at his hair as he calculated. Mama and he had, after all, been having difficulty making ends meet. Two weeks later, arrangements for the mission were completed. Will you see my father? Arcadia asked before he left. Sure, I'll see him, said Papa. I'll tell him you're safe and everything's okay, and when the war is over, I'll bring you back. Here's how to find him. His name is Dr. Torin Darrell, and he lives in Stanmark. That's just outside Terminus City, and you can get a little commuting plane that goes there. We're at 55 Channel Drive. Wait, I'll write it down. No, no, Arcadia's arm shot out. You mustn't write anything down. You must remember. And would you tell him something from me? Uh, sure. What is it? I want to whisper it to you. She leaned toward him, and the little whispered sound passed from one to the other. Papa's eyes were round. That's what you want me to say, but it doesn't make sense. He'll know what you mean. Just say it exactly the way I told you. Say I said he would know what it means. Don't forget it. 
How can I forget it? Five little words. Listen to... No, no, she hopped up and down in the intensity of her feelings. Don't repeat it. Don't ever repeat it to anyone. Promise me. All right, all right. As he passed down the drive to where the air taxi waited to take him to the spaceport, she wondered if she had signed his death warrant. She wondered if she would ever see him again. Maybe when it was all over, she had better kill herself for what she had done to him.